Welcome to lecture number 14. Today's topic will be American involvement in the Vietnam War. The subject will be approached in two ways. First, we'll explore how and why the United States became involved in the Vietnam War to begin with. We'll then trace the escalation of American activity in the war by investigating the different policies developed by each president impacted by the war, from Truman to Nixon. The question of why the United States became involved in the Vietnam War is a good place to begin. The best explanation I've seen as to why the United States became involved in the Vietnam War was simple. It became involved to contain the spread of communism into new areas. The best book on this subject was written by George Herring and first published in 1979. The title of that book was Vietnam, America's Longest War. A lot of information from this lecture comes from this book. I'd encourage people to read it if they're interested in this subject. Do you remember this slide from an earlier lecture? Containment was developed by George F. Kennan and adopted by the U.S. government early in the Cold War. Later, it was applied to events in Vietnam. Let me go ahead and begin with a little background. Prior to the Second World War, Vietnam was a colony of France. Following the war, in many ways, Vietnam was a divided country. The Americans had more influence in the South, and the Soviets had more influence in the North. Eventually, Vietnam became a battleground between the Americans and Soviets in the Cold War. We can now explore the beginnings of American involvement in Vietnam by studying the administrations of Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, and John Kennedy. Truman was the first president to take interest in the fight against communism in Vietnam. In 1950, money was allotted to help anti-communist fight in the South. If you remember, this is the same year the Korean War began, so the United States was becoming more concerned about events taking place in Asia. Presidents Eisenhower and Kennedy were associated with the U.S. policy of nation-building. A definition of this term would be the U.S. policy to prevent South Vietnam from falling to communism. Eisenhower was once asked at a press conference, Why do we care what's going on in Vietnam? He responded by saying, Well, if you have a row of dominoes and one falls down, the entire row would then fall. This gave us the domino theory. Kennedy supported a middle course in Vietnam. He wanted to send enough troops to ensure South Vietnam's survival, yet he wasn't ready for a full-fledged fight in the region. At the end of Eisenhower's presidency, there were 600 American advisors in Vietnam, while when Kennedy left office, he had increased the U.S. commitment to about 16,000 troops. American involvement in the Vietnam War escalated in the mid to late 1960s under President Lyndon Johnson. The United States never declared war in Vietnam, but due to an incident involving an American ship in 1964, the President was given the authority to use force. The name of the ship was the Maddox, and it was engaged in electronic espionage in the Gulf of Tonkin, as shown by the arrow on this map. Evidence of the attack was unclear, however, Johnson quickly asked Congress for the authority to retaliate. In order to protect American interests in the region, Congress passed a resolution which allowed the President to take all necessary measures to fight communism in Vietnam. Essentially, it gave Johnson a blank check to send troops into combat without a declaration of war. While it's true that opposition to the Vietnam War was strong in later years, initially there was support for the war, as is reflected by the near-unanimous vote on the resolution in both houses of Congress. I thought I would include this slide to try to make a link to current events. This is the text of the joint resolution which authorized the use of force against Iraq passed by Congress in October of 2002. Basically, it gave President Bush the authority to send troops into combat in Iraq, yet there was no declaration of war. This passed very strongly in both the House and the Senate. President Bush was allowed to send troops into combat to, quote, defend U.S. national security against the threat posed by Iraq and to enforce all relevant Security Council resolutions regarding Iraq. The President also has to keep the Speaker of the House and the President Pro Tem of the Senate informed and to report to all of Congress every 60 days. If you want to see a full text of the Iraq War Resolution, you can click on the hyperlink below.
With the passage of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution in 1964, Johnson had the ability to increase the number of U.S. troops in Vietnam. Well, in 1965, following the attack at a U.S. base in Pleiku, as shown here with an arrow on the map, Johnson used that authority. Johnson struggled with the decision to increase the number of U.S. forces in Vietnam, but he was not one to do something halfway. In 1965, Operation Rolling Thunder was undertaken, which involved about 50,000 American troops. This was followed by additional deployments, and by 1968, about a half a million forces had been sent to Vietnam. LBJ did not want to be the president on board when the United States had lost a war, so he sent large numbers of American troops, hoping this would bring an end to the conflict. In 1965, we see the first protests against American involvement in the Vietnam War, primarily associated with college students. The best example of this took place in Washington, D.C., when about 25,000 protesters converged on the nation's capital in opposition to the war. While high-profile leaders such as Robert F. Kennedy, John Kennedy's brother, and Martin Luther King Jr. joined protesters in later years, the majority of the American people supported the war until late 1967 or early 1968. The Tet Offensive had a major impact on the course of the war in Vietnam. The Tet Offensive took place in late January of 1968 and was a major offensive undertaken by the North Vietnamese as they attacked about a hundred important cities in South Vietnam. This initially was quite successful as it caught the Americans and South Vietnamese completely by surprise and casualty rates were quite high. After about a month, however, communist forces were repulsed and eventually this turned into a military defeat for the North as they were pushed back to their original positions. This figure shows the increasing number of American combat deaths in Vietnam from the early 1960s to 1970s. As you can see, 1968 was a particularly bloody year. The high casualty rates came on the heels of several pronouncements of military leaders that victory was just around the corner. As the body bags returned with dead soldiers, there appeared to be a credibility gap between what leaders were saying and what people were watching on the nightly news in their living rooms. Even though the Tet Offensive was a defeat on the battlefield for the North Vietnamese, this turned out to be a crucial public relations victory for the North because it signified a turning point in the Vietnam War. Opposition to the war grew dramatically in 1968. We'll now explore some of this opposition to American involvement in the war, including members of the so-called counterculture. A few traits seem to characterize the counterculture movement. For their parents' generation, a three-piece suit might be an expected form of clothing for young men, and crew cuts were quite common. Parents were in monogamous relationships, and alcohol was the drug of choice. For the new baby boomers, jeans and a tie-dye shirt were often worn, and long hair replaced the crew cut. Free love was more popular, and illegal drugs such as LSD and marijuana replaced alcohol. Children of the baby boom seemed to want to counter everything that their parents' generation had undertaken. Possibly the greatest event which symbolized the counterculture movement took place over three days in August of 1969. The event was named Woodstock, and the location was upstate New York. More than 400,000 young people lived in the rain and mud while listening to live music. The Beatles were clearly the most popular rock band of the era, and their evolution seemed to embody the counterculture. Early on, they had shorter hair and sang songs like, She Loves You, or I Want to Hold Your Hand. Later in the decade, they wore their hair very long and had bushy beards, and among other hits, they had songs like Lucy, In the Sky, with Diamonds, which some people argued glorified acid use. This poster, featuring singer Joan Baez and her sisters, encourages young men to just say no in 1968. Of course, she was referring to the draft. The poster also implies a benefit to boys who say no. This is in sharp contrast to the two posters from the Second World War. The first encourages young men to enlist in the military and destroy the mad brute of the subhuman German gorilla. The poster on the far right implies that if one wants to be a real man, he should join the Navy. The counterculture movement and the issue of the Vietnam War further divided the Democratic Party. Lyndon Johnson decided not to run for re-election in the spring of 1968. While campaigning, Robert Kennedy, John Kennedy's younger brother, was killed by an assassin's bullet following the California primary in June of 1968. On the left, we see images of the Democratic Convention from later in 1968. 
anti-war activists who staged protests outside the convention were beaten and gassed by Chicago police. In many ways, 1968 can be seen as a year of turmoil for the country. I've already mentioned the Tet Offensive and Robert Kennedy's assassination. In April of 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was also assassinated. When news of his death was heard, it was followed by rioting in over a hundred cities throughout the country, including the nation's capital. It seemed as if the United States was being ripped apart from the inside. As a result, we see voters become more conservative, and the American people elected Richard Nixon to the White House, someone who promised a return to law and order. Richard Nixon developed his policy to get the United States out of Vietnam. Vietnamization was the name for Nixon's program to get the United States out of the Vietnam War. First of all, the United States would gradually withdraw troops from Vietnam. Secondly, the Americans would train and equip the South Vietnamese to fight on their own. Last, Nixon hoped to begin negotiations with the North Vietnamese to end the war. The only problem with this scenario was that the North Vietnamese knew how unpopular the war was in the United States. They realized that it was in their best interest to extend the war, so for quite some time they refused to negotiate. In order to pressure the North Vietnamese to come to the bargaining table, Nixon expanded the war by invading the neutral nation of Cambodia, which had become a staging ground for North Vietnamese forces. When Nixon's actions became public, students all over the country protested. At Kent State University, the National Guard was called out to stop the student protest. Four students were killed, and several others were wounded. Following the so-called Christmas bombings of late 1972, early 1973, a peace agreement was reached between the Americans and the North Vietnamese. We'll now explore some of the legacy associated with the Vietnam War. American involvement in the Vietnam War left a lasting legacy for the nation. First of all, it demonstrated that global containment was a failure. Maybe communism could be contained in Europe or in parts of the Western Hemisphere, but it was impossible to do so worldwide. Secondly, involvement divided the American people like no issue had in the last 100 years. Third, it undermined the nation's self-confidence. Many Americans began to think the United States was becoming a second-rate world power. At the time, this was called the Vietnam Syndrome. Lastly, it led to the deaths of about 58,000 Americans and possibly 2 million Vietnamese casualties. Well, this ends the lecture on the Vietnam War. I hope you learned something new today. The next few slides will include hyperlinks to more information, as well as sources used for this lecture. Have a great day.